Hey you guys, it's Carolyn from Homesteading Family and today I'm gonna to be showing you one of the easiest meals to get on your shelf. We're gonna be canning beef stew. You're gonna be amazed at how quick this project is, how easy it is, and how delicious it turns out. Hey, if you wanna see the written directions for this project, click the link below in the description to go on over to a blog post on this exact project. One of my favorite things to can is complete meals or convenience foods. I love having ready-made meals on the shelf, something that I know is healthy, easy to grab, and doesn't cost a ton of money. And this is one of the easiest convenience convenience meals to put together. This is beef stew. You're gonna be surprised at how easy this is. Now I have all of my equipment together. Let's talk real fast about what we need. You're gonna need your jar lifters. You're gonna want um, a some sort of a tool to get any bubbles out of the jars. This is an actual bubble popper, but you can use any sort of wooden implement or plastic implement for this that you can slide down into your jars like this. Of course, you're gonna want um, some measuring spoons. You're gonna want some clean kitchen towels, a good clean dish cloth. You're gonna want a little bit of white vinegar ready to go in a dish. And you'll need your jars. Now, I love canning in these wide mouth quart size mason jars, so that's what I'll be using today. But you could use a pint size jar. You could use small mouth if you wanted. Um, but it's a lot easier to work with a wide mouth in any size that you're going with. If you're looking for just a single serving size of beef stew, you could even use a half pint jar if that's what worked for you. Of course, you'll need your new lids and you'll need some bands. That's about it, that is so easy. Okay, let's talk about the ingredients. Now, this is a wonderfully free form meal. Every single one of these ingredients is safe to can all by itself or in combination with each other. So you get to choose the amounts of each ingredient you wanna use per jar. But what you'll need is some stew beef, you could also use cubed pork, you could use venison, you could even use chicken if you wanted. You're gonna want potatoes that have been peeled and then chopped. Some onions and some peeled and then again chopped um, carrots here. And you're gonna want some salt. You can use any kind of good quality salt that you want. You don't have to only use canning salt when you're canning. But the difference is between the canning salt and a salt like this, this is a Redmond real salt, so it has a lot of minerals in it, is it might make your broth a little bit cloudy. Well, the broth is gonna be cloudy anyways because we've got potatoes going in there, so you're gonna see a little bit of the starchiness in there, so I'm not worried about it at all, and I'd rather use my really good quality salt than something with chemicals that I don't want in there. Okay, so, Step one, when we're doing anything with the pressure, oh, I forgot to mention the pressure canner. Of course, we're gonna have our pressure canner. Doing anything with meat and low acid vegetables requires a pressure canner. So back here, I have my All-American pressure canner. The All-Americans are my absolute favorite canners to use. And I have some water already put in there. We're only gonna put about two inches of water into that canner. That's really important. Whenever you're pressure canning, you never want to submerge your entire jars in water in the pressure canner. Now that's very different than water bath canning. I also have a couple kettles of hot water going because I'm gonna need to cover all the ingredients in the jar with the hot water. You could also use broth if you wanted to. Okay, so whenever we're canning, I like to teach it in 10 different steps if we're pressure canning. And the first step is to prepare our jars, our lids, and our canners. You no longer have to sterilize jars. Yay, that's great, it saves us a whole step. But you do need to have them clean, washed with hot soapy water, and warm. So these jars are still warm to the touch. You'll also want to do the same with your lids. You don't have to keep these in warm water anymore either. In fact, it's not even recommended to do that anymore. 
hot soapy water with uh, washed with a soft cloth, nothing scrubby for this bottom enamel on here, um, is a great way to go and it'll just get you nice and clean. Same thing with your bands, just hot soapy water. We also want to get our water into our canner, which I've already done, and get it warming up. Now our goal is to have this canner almost steaming, the water inside this canner almost steaming, not quite, by the time we're ready to put our loaded jars in there. So right now I just have it on a very, very gentle heat. Okay, are you ready for how easy this is? I'm gonna get my hands right in because it's gonna make it really easy. So all I'm gonna do is take whatever meat I have and go ahead and just start filling my jars. Now, if you wanna be real even about it, you could put a cup of your meat in and a cup of each of the other vegetables in. These are quart sized jars, so that would fill you up just about right. But you know what? I'm just gonna kinda eyeball this right here. And of course, if you don't like using your hands to get into your ingredients, you are welcome to use a tool with a funnel on the top of your jar, that would work just fine. Now, this is again, the really like quick and dirty method of doing this. Like this is gonna get the job done and it's gonna taste great, but there's a lot of ways to upgrade that. And the most notable of that would be to brown this beef in just a little bit of oil before you did that. That would make the color hold even a little bit nicer and um, and give it that kind of browned flavor to it that tastes so good. But if you're doing a lot of these jars, one after the other, browning it really does take some time. And sometimes you just have to get this stuff done. So this is the kind of um, quick way to do it. Okay, so I've got just about the same amount of meat in each of these jars, roughly. Ooh. Okay, and then I'm gonna go to my potatoes. Now, again, it's really important that your potatoes have been peeled. We don't wanna work with any root vegetables in canning that have not been peeled. So you wanna wash them first, peel them, and then go ahead and dice them. Now, you could leave out any of these ingredients if you wanted. Let's say you didn't want the potato in there. You could definitely go with um, just extra carrots and onions. You could put a little celery in here if you wanted. You could even leave out the meat if you're just looking for a hearty vegetable stew. That would be just fine. All right, I'll just use the rest of these guys up. And then on to the carrots and just the same thing. Chop it up. Now, we're looking to keep about a one inch headspace here. So we don't want to overfill our jars past about this big ring right there. Now you saw, I just went ahead and settled some of those ingredients down a little in this jar. Do you see how much more room we got? And you can do that. You don't wanna shove them down too hard. You don't want it too tightly packed, but you can definitely remove a little bit of that air space in there to get a little bit more. Oh, I'm throwing carrots. Okay, you guys are watching this real time. Can you believe how easy this is? And this is the hardest part of pressure canning, by the way, preparing your uh, preserve. Whatever it is you're pre preserving, um, this is step two, and it's the hardest part. So if you can get through following a recipe, then you've got pressure canning down. You can completely do it. Okay, and now the same thing with the onions. I'm just gonna top it off a little and try not to cry in the process. These are garden fresh onions, and let me tell you, they are really, really potent. Um, I love this time of year when all of the amazing things are coming out of the garden, and they're so delicious, so amazing. Okay, six jars of beef stew, almost completely ready to go into the canner. Oh, I love how fast this is. Now again, you can adjust the amounts any way you like them. Okay, and the last thing that we need to add here is salt. Now if you're using these quart sized jars, you wanna put about a teaspoon of salt in each jar. 
If you are um, using a pint size, you'd go with a half teaspoon. So I'm just gonna put it right over the top. It will work its way through everything. Now you could add some other dry herbs or spices if you wanted. At this point, you'd wanna stay away from some of the stronger ones like um, some sage or even too much oregano because they can turn a little bitter in the length of time that this is going to be in the canner. But if you wanted to, you could add some other seasonings to the jar right now, dry spices or herbs. Um, I like to keep it kind of plain so I can take it in different directions when it comes out of the canner. All right, now I'm gonna grab my hot water. And this is actually boiling right now. And I'm gonna cover up all of those things right to that one inch band on that jar. All of the ingredients in there are totally covered up. Now again, you could use a beef broth in this. You could use actually just about any sort of broth but whatever you're using, you want it to be relatively low fat. One of the challenges with canning is that if you get too much fat in that jar, it can actually keep your jars from sealing well, kind of lubricates the undersides of the lids and we don't want that. Okay, now we're gonna take our bubble popping tool. Again, you could use a plastic knife for this. You could use a um, wooden skewer. And we're just gonna go down in four different places around the jar just to make sure we don't have any really big bubbles hiding in there that would uh, cause a change in our headspace as we can. Okay. And then we're just gonna top off that liquid back to that one inch headspace. Now, if you don't feel confident about measuring out that one inch, you can always use the other side of this thing. It's called a headspace ruler down here by just sticking it in and making sure that your liquid in your food only comes to that one inch line on there. All right, now at this point, I usually just take a look and adjust a little bit if it's needed. And I see that I have one jar that's just a little bit over full and I wanna make sure that I don't keep anything over full. I don't have very many onions in there, so I'm gonna reach down and try and get a few of the carrots out of there to just to make a little bit more room in that jar. There we go, that is perfect. Okay, now we want to clean the rims. This is step number three, is to get the lids onto this jar. And first thing we wanna do is make sure that these rims are entirely clean. So I have a little bit of white vinegar here. Whenever I'm canning with meat, I wanna make sure to use white vinegar just to remove any little bit of fat that might have gotten on the rim. And a clean cloth and I'm just gonna clean off the rim all the way around, making sure there's no little grains of salt or anything else sitting up there that might disrupt the seal. Okay, now I'm gonna take my brand new lids and I'm just gonna lay them out first. Now we're not working with a very large batch, so we can just do these all at once. But if you are working with a very large batch, sometimes I do 19 jars at a time in a larger canner, I would want to do them in small batches like this. Now the way we're gonna put our lids on is we're going to make sure our lids are centered, put the bands over the top, then hold the lids down, and screw them on. We're just gonna screw them on finger tight, which means I don't want to get my wrist involved and start cranking on anything. You can put these lids on too tight for their own good. All right, now my canner has come up to just about a steam, so I went ahead and turned it off, and we're ready to load the canner. Now, I'm sure that I have a rack at the bottom 
You always want to make sure there's a rack at the bottom of your canner. And then you're just going to settle your jars right on in. Okay, now I always double check that my lids in the necks of the jars are not covered by water before I move ahead to the next step, which is to get my lid on my canner. Okay, if you're using one of these All-Americans, what you're gonna wanna do is make sure that this lid is level and then put your screw bands on And then we're going to tighten them that down um, with the tightening the screws that are straight across from each other, two at a time. That's to help keep that lid on evenly. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and turn our canner on and bring it up to a full steam. It's really best if you bring the canner up to temperature uh, slowly, that way you don't go way past and then you have a hard time getting your temperature regulated in your canner. So I recommend bringing it up to a medium high heat and letting it sit there for a while, seeing if that will do the job. All right, step number four to pressure canning is venting your canner. And that's what we're doing now. We've brought up the pressure inside the canner and it's now steaming. And we're gonna let this steam for about 10 minutes once it comes to a solid steam. Right now it's still a little bit broken. I'm not ready to start my actual timer yet. It'll get there any second though. All right, so the steam is all the way at its full venting level and it's time to go ahead and start that 10 minute timer to completely vent the canner. All right, so step number five, now that the canner has vented for 10 minutes is to pressurize the canner. And that's where I'm gonna go ahead and put my weight on. Now I'll be using my weighted gauge and not the dial gauge for this canner. So I wanna make sure to choose the correct weight for my elevation. For me, I'm gonna be canning at 15 pounds pressure, but you need to check your elevation and make sure you're canning at the correct pressure. We're just gonna slip this right on on. Ooh, that got nice and quiet, didn't it? All right, so now we're going to let this canner come up to its full pressure. Because I'm using this weighted gauge, I'll be listening for the canner to start jiggling or that weight to start jiggling. We're aiming for about four jiggles per minute. It's a little hard to be that precise, but that's the goal we're headed towards. Now, we wanna remember to go ahead and bring this pressure up slowly so that we don't just blow past our goal pressure and then have to come back down and then it takes a long time to get your pressure stable. So slowly coming up is the way to go. Okay, we're still just a little bit over pressure, but we're ready to start that 90 minute timer now for step number six, which is to process your food. So it's processing when it's at high pressure, when it's at the correct pressure or above, and we're gonna hold that at that pressure for, a, for 90 minutes on this particular stew. Okay, so the canner has been processing for its full 90 minutes. It's time to go ahead and turn it off. Now we're moving on to step seven, which is to cool the canner. Now this is really important step that we do this correctly. We want it naturally to come all the way down to zero pressure. That means I'm not gonna sit here and hit my weight. I'm not gonna remove the weight. I'm not gonna do anything until this comes all the way naturally down to no pressure or zero pressure. And that's when you would use the dial gauge on an All-American canner is to tell when it's telling you that it's down to zero. Now this is gonna take probably half an hour to 45 minutes to cool all the way, so we're just gonna wait. 
All right, the pressure has come all the way back down to zero, so now we can go ahead and remove the weight. There might be a little steam that comes out when, that, when you remove it, and that's okay, that's normal. Um, we're going to let the canner sit just like that for between five and 10 minutes. We're not gonna open it yet. We're just gonna let that uh, pressure equalize from the outside to the inside of the canner. Okay, so now we're ready to move on to step eight, which is to remove the jars from the pressure canner and then to let them cool. So now it's time to go ahead and take the lid off the pressure canner. Now these jars are still very, very hot. In fact, they're probably still boiling on the inside of them. So we wanna be really careful while we pull them out. We also want to be absolutely sure that we don't tip them or bonk them against anything. Now we're gonna bring them out and set them onto a towel, giving them about two fingers width of space in between each jar. All right, and there you have it. You have six quarts of wonderful beef stew ready to go, but we're not quite done yet because we need to let these sit for about 16 hours undisturbed in order to let them cool all the way and let their seals on their lids um, seal all the way down and firm up. Okay, so after we do that 18 hour, we're going to take the next steps. And here is some beef stew that I made a couple days ago and I canned it a couple days ago. Now the vegetables were all mixed up in this and not just in layers like this one. So that's why it looks a little bit different. But now we're gonna move on to step nine, which is to check the seals. Now you want to do this right after they have cooled all the way down at about that 16 to 18 hour mark. And the reason for that is if you have a jar that did not seal properly, it's still safe to eat for 24 hours after it comes out of the canner. So you can get it at that point, put it into your refrigerator and consume it within the next few days. It needs to make it into the refrigerator within that 24 hours though, if it's not sealed. So both of these sealed beautifully. We need to go ahead and take their bands off and clean the jars at all if they're at all dirty or sticky or anything has gotten on the outside of them. You never wanna put anything dirty into your pantry. Okay, now we need to make sure that we label our jars. Never put anything away that's not labeled. I like to take a permanent marker and just write right on the top of the lids what is in it and the year that's on it. And now step number 10 is to store our jars. So you're gonna to wanna to put these on your pantry shelf somewhere where they don't get uh, too hot, like 120 degrees hot, and somewhere where they don't freeze, but they're generally shelf stable. And of course it's best if they're in a dark environment so that you don't lose nutritional value. And then whenever you're ready to use them, you're just gonna pull them out, pull the lid off, dump it into a pot, heat it up, and it's ready to eat. These are absolutely delicious, served over egg noodles, over rice, over any other grain that you like to use, or they're really good all by themselves with a side of salad and some fresh sourdough French bread. It's absolutely delicious and a wonderful way to get a meal on your shelf. Enjoy, you guys.